I would like for us to move into the context where Jesus says, I was hungry, y'all fed me. Naked, you clothed me. In prison, and you visited me. Now, Lord, when did we see these things and meet those needs? As much as you do it unto the least of these, you do it to me. Every time you help somebody, in Jesus' name, you're helping God's son. Now, let me move to a third word quickly. Let me talk to you about the word possibility. Well, what's the possibility of seeing somebody with a need, having this world's goods, and look what the possibility is, and shuts up his heart from him? I thought this was interesting. The Greek New Testament used such language that it translates slamming the door. So let me just see it. Now, I don't want to scare you, so brace yourself. It's like you see a need, God has helped you to deliberately contemplate that need. You've looked at it, you think, you've sized it up, and you thought there's a need, and you slam the door. I mean, just, is that cold and calculated or what? It means the snapping of a lock. When the Bible says he shuts up his heart, that speaks of the seed of affection in your life. He locks the door. Listen to this. He locks the door on his compassion. Aren't you glad when you called out and needed God's compassion through Jesus Christ that his arms were extended? I thank God he didn't slam the door, but he said that he stands at my heart's door and knocks. And if any man will hear his voice and open the door, he comes in and fellowships with us. And then he poses a question. You see it in the latter part of verse 17? How does the love of God abide in him? Here's, here's a good translation. How's it possible? How's it, here's what ought to be asked. Somebody contemplates a need. They're able to deliberately see a need in somebody's life. They have this world's goods, and they slam the door in their heart. Is it, how's, it, how's it possible that the love of God abides in that person's heart? It is questionable if God's love exists. In that verse, the latter part of verse number 14, look at it again, verse 14. We know that we pass from death to life. How? Because we love the brethren. Listen to this. He who does, does not love his brother abides in death. Good night, he's saying. Man, you, you have reason to question whether you're even saved or not if you're that cold toward knees. All right, give me a fourth word, and let me just walk through this quickly. The last word is the word participation. Verse 18. My little children. Don't you love that language? This is John. He's the age of John now. Scholarship believes he's probably in his 90s. And old, old John, matter of fact, he's, he's told in chapter 1 about how he handled the word of life. And it's, uh, it's almost in his mind's eyes, thinking back on that uh, incredible relationship he had with Jesus Christ. And now as he pins these words, and most scholars believe that every word, every word in these five chapters are pinned to the body of Christ. And he says, my little children, let us not love in word or in tongue. Talk is cheap, but in deed and in truth. There it is again. Love is a verb, an action word. You can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. Actions speak louder than words. I've heard it. I'd rather see a sermon than hear one. So we participate. I guess the best illustration in the scriptures is the story of Jesus and the Good Samaritan. I've had the opportunity to be on uh, that road, the old Jericho Road. Dangerous place, to say the least. Very difficult to drive there. I can only imagine what it was like in Jesus' day. In that story, we have the story of the thief, priest, Levite, and the Good Samaritan. Someone said you'll find this in that text. Greed, guarding, giving, attackers, ignorers, and carers. He said the first one in this story says what is yours is mine and I'm going to take it. There's takers in this world. What's yours is mine and I'm going to take it. And the second said what's mine is mine. That's the preacher. And the Levi, he's the minister of music. And I'm going to keep it. What's mine is mine, and I'm going to keep it. But the third is the Lord Jesus. And listen to what he said. 
What's mine is yours, and I'm going to give it. Now, I want to say that again. I want to ask you in Jesus' name, which of these fits the Lord Jesus Christ, and do we really want to be like God's son? Now, here it, here it is. Number one, what's yours is mine, and I'm going to take it. You believe Jesus is pleased with that? Thank you. God bless you. <laughs> Hello. Secondly, what's mine is mine, and I'm going to keep it. You think the Lord Jesus Christ is pleased with that attitude? How about this one? What's mine is yours, I'm going to give it. That's it. The problem with the first two is there's observation without any obligation. No commitment. The second, there's ability. There's ability without availability. I could do it, but I'm not going to avail myself to it. And the third problem is some people have positions with no mission. If we're going to be like the Lord Jesus, it's not about our position. It's about our mission. Heavenly Father, thank you for just giving some glimpses of who you are to remind us when we take of this bread and take of this juice of what you did for us. And then you have just as clear as you could say it, have said, as I've done for you, do to others. And I know that when you died on the cross, you died for every economic status. You died for every color, every race, every language, every tongue. There are no minorities to Jesus Christ. And I pray that we would be like you. Make us like you. Help us to come to the point to say what's mine is yours and I will get it. Heads bowed and eyes closed. We're getting ready to go to the table of our Lord. It's a time of personal examination. I'm going to give a simple invitation for the altar to be open. And if the Spirit of God has been speaking to you and there's something you want to deal with, before the Lord, I want you to get up out of your seat and come and make your way to the altar now. Just become right now. If God's speaking, you've been dealing with something, you come. There's pastors here at the front, and here's what we're going to ask you to do. If you've not said yes to Jesus, God loves you. Christ died for you, and you can experience God's love tonight if you'll repent of your sins and put your faith in Jesus. God's speaking to your heart. I'm going to encourage you to make your way to the nearest aisle. There's a pastor here at the front at the end of every aisle. So you can begin to make your way right now. If you want to say, I want to give my life to Jesus, just come right now. Maybe there's some friends and families here tonight, an individual, God's been speaking to you, and you're beginning to sense this is the church. The Heavenly Father wants you to align yourself with, to become part of this ministry. Our doors are wide open. So you get up right now if this is the church you believe God wants you to be a part of, and you just come right now. Tell one of these dear brothers, I'm coming to unite with this fellowship. Maybe God's calling you to some particular ministry. We had one to surrender to preach this morning, Brother Tim Jackson, in our 11 o'clock service. Maybe God's calling you to something. Are you open to allowing the God who made you, the one you'll spend forever with, to speak into your life? Just keep coming. In fact, let's just stand together. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, I just pray you'd speak to us in these few moments before we partake of the table. We praise you tonight. We thank you. We worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.